I want to um, address you today not as seekers only, although that's a very honorable thing to be, a seeker of truth, a seeker of the sacred, seeker of the holy, seeker of the just, seeker of love. But I actually want to address you today as visionaries, because I feel that our world is in urgent need of holier visions than we are often used to holding in our minds, in our hearts, and in our thoughts. And when I was thinking about this word renewal, it seemed to me to partner so well with the word vision, that what kind of renewal are we wanting to evoke? And that first or simultaneously with renewal, we need to bring to it a sense of vision, and not just a sense of vision, but an ambitious sense of vision, really bringing into that vision all of who we are and all of who we could be, so that we would be able literally to visualize and imagine and, and take ourselves into the kind of behaviors, thoughts, actions that will bring heaven to earth. Choosing, choosing is so vital here. And it's vital in part because we are so pulled by our mainstream culture towards a kind of cynicism and pessimism that is deeply eroding. It's actually insulting to the gift of life that we all have. So when we choose to live more compassionately, more hopefully, more thoughtfully, more joyously, with greater celebration, and also with greater softness, when we make those choices, they are highly significant, not for ourselves only, but also for the world that we are mutually creating. That's why I so much value our coming together here, because in making those choices, we are really exceptionally dependent on the encouragement that we can give to one another. We don't renew, we don't grow in love, we don't grow in discernment on our own. We do it because we are courageous enough to come together and we are humble enough to learn from one another and we are also humble enough to learn from life and from our mistakes. It's wonderful what we can learn from our triumphs, but sometimes it's especially important what we can learn from the difficult times. And that is our sacred covenant with one another. What can we teach one another? What can we learn from one another as spiritual beings on a human journey? And what can we hold for one another in terms of our conviction about renewal, even in the darkest times. It's relatively easy, isn't it, when things are going well. It's so much harder when things are difficult for us, when we feel helpless or hopeless or powerless. Just a very small example. Um, a few nights ago, when I was finishing the liturgy, I <clears throat> had to ring Kim about the music that we would be listening to today. And it was the end of a very long day. It was really late at night. And Kim was tired, and I was tired. But he shared with me a few words of encouragement, not just about the music and not just about the liturgy, but actually about the value of the work. And he could have had no idea how re-spiriting that was for me at that moment. We never know when we're going to be instruments of renewal and hope for other people. And we should never let ourselves miss an opportunity to be that. In Forgiveness and Other Acts of Love, I talk about much graver situations much more terrible, sometimes terrifying situations in which we feel utterly powerless, when we have to, in a sense, abandon all the strategies that are not working for us and simply open ourselves to a new and quite different level of inspiration. 
And thinking about that, I wanted to share with you the verse from Deuteronomy that I've shared with you often, but truly it's a verse for me that I can renew my knowledge of every single day in order to understand, as Baal Shem Tov has taught me, that I need to be reborn each day with my vision of love. And this is the, this is the verse. I have put before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. And I find that such a powerful teaching because to me it brings in not just the question of choice, where are we going with each of the choices that we make? Who are we influencing? What kind of inspiration are we allowing ourselves to be influenced by? But also, how are we affecting others? And in a time of suffering, this is extraordinarily important. So what I'm really inviting you to think about is how will we participate in life more positively, regardless of the circumstances that are delivered to us in any particular moment? And there seem to me to be three points that we could really pay attention to. That we, we would be open enough, brave enough, humble enough to seek the help that we need. To say what we need, whether we're saying it to God or to one another. It can bring us into a tremendous communion with one another to be the giver and receiver of some kind of encouragement. The second is, of course, the other side of that, to be willing to reach out to others. Not just to receive, but willing to reach out. How can I help? And the third is to be conscious, and in a sense to be increasingly conscious of what you are choosing to think about and give your attention to. You have more choice about that than you could ever know. And it is of course extremely difficult when we feel that our minds have been colonized by a sorrow. But it is particularly at those times that we need to turn to the inspiration of prayer, to the comfort of somebody who is prepared to listen and understand, and also to the voice of our own experience, to the voice that tells us, this too will pass. How do I know this? I don't know this because my life has always been delightful or delicious. Of course it hasn't. I know this because I have learnt it in the hardest times. I have learnt that it is in the hardest times we must make the most conscious choices about what we pay attention to and the company that we will seek. That we literally cannot afford in such times to pay too much attention to negativity. We must pay attention to the divine grace that we call hope. We must nourish hope however we can and however beautifully we can, whether it's through music, whether it's through prayer, whether it's the companionship of others, or whether it's what we pay attention to through the body. Our gardening, our walking, our meals, our sharing, all those gifts of the everyday material life that can make such a difference in allowing kindness to enter our hearts. I've also been thinking about the Buddha's Four Noble Truths. The first of these is that in life there is suffering which isn't news to anybody here. And the other three Noble Truths, which I might teach again on in a very short time, teach us that while some of this suffering is inevitable, particularly the suffering of mortality, the suffering of illness, the suffering of loss, the suffering of grief, the suffering of death. All of that is inevitable. But what is not inevitable is some of the other suffering that we cause ourselves 
or cause others. So in our processes of renewal, we can also make a brave and bold decision to align ourselves to the very best of our ability, beyond our ability, tuning our minds and thoughts to the music of our souls so that we are part of the forces of healing and we are not contributing to the suffering. This is what spiritual life is actually about. And everything that we call spiritual practice simply feeds into this realization that each of us has been given the gift, the tremendous possibility of being part of the forces of healing, of delight, of gratitude, of appreciation in our world. Thinking about the Four Noble Truths, I read this from the Dalai Lama. Practice and teaching must be part of life he said, it is not enough just to go to church on Sunday and join your hands together in prayer. It's not enough. It's lovely. It's lovely. But it's not enough. You must do more. The rest of your behavior and thinking must change. Your actions, your power to influence others for the better, and to receive the love that is pouring towards you must also change. In some situations, I am very aware that there are no easy answers. And whether you are listening to me today or whether you are somebody who's listening to me many weeks or even years from now as this talk is played on YouTube, we need to hold in our minds that each moment of existence is not only precious, it is laden with opportunity for us to ask brief, simple questions of the power of love that lives in our own hearts. To ask ourselves What would bring me greater peace in this moment? How would the wisest person that I know walk forward from this moment? What difference would it make in this moment if I were to open to healing? Step by step and moment by moment, we open ourselves to the beauty of who we are step by step and moment by moment. And sometimes we only reach towards and recognize those gifts because this is a moment that would otherwise crush us. But instead of that, we are standing with our, all those brothers and sisters who listened to that prayer from Deuteronomy over thousands of years now. We are standing with them and we are saying, we are choosing life. We are choosing blessings, not for ourselves only, but also so that all those around us and our descendants may live.